the parallax effect is one of the coolest ways to add richness and creativity to a website. In this video, we're going to take this boring and static website and convert it to a more engaging and dynamic one by creating this parallax effect when moving the mouse as well as when revealing the page. Very cool. Looking closer, we see that the background image is consists from a bunch of layers that moves with different speeds when moving the mouse and when revealing the page, which is exactly what parallax means. This is gonna be a beginner friendly tutorial where I will show you step by step how you can make this animated parallax website starting from the process of cutting images and editing them in photoshop then moving to the coding part to finally have this final result that we're seeing right now. So all I ask you for is a like to help this content grow more and hit that subscribe button to see if we can hit 100,000 subs by the end of this year. So without any further ado, let's get going. Oh. Did I tell you that this is responsive as well? Actually, it is responsive on all devices including tablets and mobiles, which makes it even more interesting because you know what they say, responsive websites are awesome. Alright, let's move on. So right now we just have an empty folder with nothing except these images which I got from Nsplash. By the way, there is a link down below in the description where you can get access to all these images and everything else you need to get started in this project and follow me along. Anyway, so now we need to cut out all these mountains from their background. So to do so, we will need a little help from Photoshop. Once you're here, go duplicate this layer, then go check this background eraser tool. Now put some solid color in between these two layers so that later on we see how we're going with the eraser. So essentially what this tool does is when you click on some area, it tells Photoshop what color the background is based on the sampled area. Then as long as you drag the tool over the image, it will erase only that sampled color leaving all the other colors untouched. Now every time the color of the background changes, we need to sample again that new color. And in case this starts in erasing our object, we can fix that very simply by decreasing this solder and slider. So yeah, let's keep going. And don't worry if the background is not perfectly erased, we're fixing that later. I got you covered. So let's fast forward through now and I will see you when I finish. Once you're done, you need to make a selection of what you currently have. So for that, hold command on Mac or control on PC, then click on the layer. After that, go back to this layer where we have the complete image and hit this mic icon. And just like that, we now have a mask of the same thing. And if we hold Option or Alt, then click on it, we can see our mask clearly. Basically, here's how a mask works. Whatever is white, that means we can see it. And whatever is black, that means it's erased and we cannot see it. Now we've only erased the areas near the edge of the mountain, so let's continue and erase what's left. To do so, grab your brush, make sure that you have here a black color and that both opacity and flow are at 100%, then start painting. We're done but we still have a small problem. As I've said before, some areas are not completely erased since as you can see the color is not really really black. But don't worry, everything is under control. All we have to do is change the brush mode to overlay, then make sure that we have here the black color. Then just paint on those areas because what this tool actually does is that it takes these slightly black areas and make them even darker without affecting the white areas. And there you go, our mountain is now ready and everything is just nice. Now the bad news is that we still have to repeat the same process over another 6 images. So I think it's better to just skip this part. Great. So here I separated the other mountains from their backgrounds, then I put them together in this PSD file. But still there is one thing missing. Exactly, it's the background. So we already have this image, but we still need to remove these mountains and fill the empty space behind them. It's actually very simple. Just grab the lasso tool, drag it around the mountains that you want to remove. Next, go to edit, then click on content aware fill and just hit OK. Photoshop then will do some calculations and fill those areas. 
Next, I would like to turn this around. So I'm just gonna press Ctrl or Command G, right click and then search for flip horizontal. Incredible. Now we will start positioning our mountains. So let's start with this one. Press Command or Ctrl G to get access to And now it's looking fine. Stay with me? Good, cause we've got one more Photoshop thing to do, which is compositing all these images. To get started, I'm gonna head over to Filter, Blur, and then Gaussian Blur. Then here, set radius to a very small value, and there you go. I would also love to modify the colors to make it a bit more greenish. So to do so, I'm gonna head over to Camera Raw Filter. Then here, I'm just gonna play around with these sliders until I get it right. Cool. Now this is not the exact color that we want, so what we're gonna do is come over here, hit this icon and click here to adjust contrast in our background. Let's also add a color balance adjustment layer, mess around with these sliders until you get it right. Now let's group all these things in one layer, give it a name, and then let's move to the next mountain. So currently the colors are not matching the background and the two images are just looking separate. To fix that, we will add a new layer. Make sure to hold optional alt then click in between these two layers to make a clipping mask then get your brush and paint some dark shadow. Great. Next we need to add another layer to create some fog. Here as you can see I'm using a particular brush. You can go ahead and get a similar one for free. Let's also add a color balance adjustment. Make sure that this one is clipped so that the adjustment applies only to the mountain. I would love also to add a levels adjustment to modify lights and darks in our image. And finally, let's add a hue and saturation layer to bring down saturation a little bit. And just like that, we have successfully matched the mountain with the background. Let's move to the next mountain. So it's mostly the same process again. Let's start off by painting some shadow in the left and little highlights right here. Then let's adjust levels adjust colors to make it a bit more greenish let's paint again this time we're gonna add a bit of brightness in right and some green highlights right over here then finally let's create a fog over our mountain like so and now we're good to move on next we need to create a new fog layer really quickly then we'll keep doing this for each mountain left so pretty easy this shouldn't take more than two minutes to finish it well apparently i was wrong but who cares, just look at how beautiful this is now. But hold on one second, we're not done yet, we still have to add a few touches to make this stand more. I'm talking about some black shadow in the bottom and some sun rays, so let's place them over here like so. Play around with the saturation and brightness, decrease the opacity and boom, we're finally done. And we can move to the most fun and interesting part which is the coding. So let's first extract each layer we have here since apparently we're doing parallax so we need to dismantle our image into different layers which layers are going to move in different speeds while moving the mouse this way we're gonna get that smooth parallax effect. Now without wasting any more time, close photoshop, open vs code and let's have some fun. To get started we have here our folder, alright I'm just kidding, let's just bring back the dark theme. I mean for real who's using a light theme while coding? Now it's better. Anyway, so I have already opened the folder where we have all the images or let's say layers that we just made in Photoshop as well as this logo image. Again, you can find all these images down in the description. Now let's start off by setting up our project. So in this project, we're gonna use HTML, CSS and JavaScript. That's why we'll need a HTML file, a CSS file and a JavaScript file. Next, head over to the HTML file, add an exclamation mark, then hit chat. This will add all that necessary code that every HTML file should have. After you give your website a name, come over here and hit this go live button. This is a VS Code extension that gets the browser refreshed automatically while you're coding. Currently, we just have a blank page because apparently we have not added any content yet. So let's go ahead and start adding content to our website. By taking a look at the demo page, we want to start off first by making this navbar. For that, we're gonna create a header tag, which will be the wrapper of our navbar. We also need to add an additional wrapper, which will be the nav element. We will use this wrapper to keep the content of our navbar from going all the way to the sides on large screens. Great, now inside the navbar, we have the logo, which will stick to the left. And then we have the links that will stick to the right. For that, we're gonna create an unordered list to wrap our links. Then we're going to add our links as list items. 
Now the third link is going to be a search icon. So let's give this list item a class of search, then let's head over to fontawesome.com, copy the search icon, then paste it inside the anchor tag. Now we still cannot use the icon in our web page unless we connect our file to the font awesome library. To do so, we need to grab this font awesome CDN, paste it in the head of our web page, and now we should see our icon in our page. Next, we should add this hamburger menu thing. So let's add a fourth list item. This one will have a class of hamburger. Then in here, we will add a link. And inside of that link, we're gonna have a div with a class of bar, which will be the wrapper of the three bars that we have inside the hamburger link. Hit save. So right now, as you can see, we just have an ugly list item and a big white logo over here. So to make this look better, we have to do some CSS. So let's first link our CSS file right here. Then let's open the file. Great, now in here, I always prefer starting with a small reset. So let's use the universal selector to select every element we have inside the HTML. Let's also select every before and after element we're going to create later. Then in here, we're gonna set pattern to zero, margin to zero, and also box size into border box. This way, when we will add some pattern or margin to an element later, its width and height will not be affected by that pattern or margin. If we take a look at our page, you can see there is no more paddings or margins on our links. Great, so now the specific font that we're going to use is again Poppins. We're gonna get that from Google Fonts, which is a good way to get a font and use it in your website without having to download it. Alright, so in here select the weights that you wanna work with. In our case, we will need thin, light, regular, and extra bold. Now come over here, copy this import code, then paste it here, and now you're good to use the font. So if we take a look, you can see that the font has now changed. Great, so now let's quickly give our web page a dark background color just so we can see the logo and the links more clearly and now we're good to move on. Alright, so now we can start styling the navbar. So let's start off by making the logo smaller. We can do that by decreasing its width to 100 pixels, like so. Now we're gonna target the header element, which is the wrapper of the whole navbar. In here, we first wanna make sure that it takes the full width. Then we wanna give it a border at the bottom of 1 pixels with the type of solid and with a white color. But we don't want this border to be completely opaque, so we're gonna add here an opacity of 0.1 to make the border a bit transparent. And yeah, great. Now inside the header tag, we have another container which is the nav element. Let me just give it a red background color like so. So now we want this nav element to keep the nav bar content from going all the way to the sides. So for that, we need first to give it a smaller width like 1400 pixels, like so. Then we need to put it in the center. Now a quick way to achieve that is by setting margin to zero on top and bottom and auto in left and right. This means that both left and right margins will take up the available space in right equally and therefore the nav bar gets centered. Great, now let's add a pattern of 2RAM in left and right and there you go. Now we want the logo to stick to the left while the links stick to the right edge. To do so, we will put flex box into action. So just give the container a display of flex and boom, we now have a flex container, which means we can align its child however we want very easily and quickly. Just let me show you. So in our case, we want to have the logo in left and the links in right. Using flexbox, that can be done just by setting justify content, which in this case controls the horizontal alignment to space between, which as it says, will take that available space on right and put it in between the logo and the UL element. Now, by default, the logo image is stretching to fill the container height. So to fix that, we will take the align items property, which in this case controls the vertical alignment, then set it to center, which means now the flex items will be in the middle and not stretched anymore. Now, obviously, we want all these links to be in one line. So we will go to the UL element, which is the container of those links, then set this to flex, and just like that, our links are already in one line because these are the default styles of the flex box. Now we will set this style to none to get rid of those ugly dots. Then let's also add here our line item center just to make sure that our links will be always centered. Next, I will target the actual links. So in here, first thing we want to do is set text decoration to none to get rid of that ugly underline on the links. I also want to change their color to white, give them some padding on left and right. Let's set text transform to uppercase to turn all the letters to uppercase. Finally, let's decrease font weight to 300 and font size to 0.83 RAM. Good. Now we want to make this a little bit bigger, so we're just gonna target the search class which we added here, then select the link inside of it. In here, we want to increase font size to something like 1.05 RAM. Let's also raise the padding on left and right to something like 3 RAM instead of 1.5 RAM that it had. 
Now last thing we have to do inside the navbar is making this hamburger button. So let's select the link inside the hamburger div. Then let's give it a width and height of 37 pixels. Then set border radius to 50%. Give it some gray transparent background color. And now we should have a circle with a gray background color, right? No, we have a weird shape that is apparently not a circle. That's because we have here an anchor element which by default has a display of online. And if an element is set to online, this means it will not accept width and height. And that is exactly what's happening here. So to fix this problem, just change the display to something like flex. Now we kinda have a circle, but it's more like an ellipse. Why we're having that is because the link has already some padding in left and right. So to fix that, just remove that padding and give it instead to its parent which is the hamburger div. And yeah, great. Now we can also add the blur filter to this to make it stand more. And we're good to move on. Now it's time to grab the bar. So in here we want it to have 52% of its parent width a height of 1.3 pixels, a white background color, and a border radius of 2 pixels. So yeah, this will make it look like a bar. Now, in order to push it to center, we're gonna use again the power of Flexbox. So the parent already has a display of flex. Now all you have to do is just set justify content to center, this will center it horizontally, and also align items to center to center it vertically. Very cool. Now we need to have two more bars, one in top and one in bottom. For these, we will add them as before and after elements of this bar diff. So let's give it here position relative so that in few moments later, we can align those before and after elements relatively to this bar diff. Now we can come down here and create those before and after elements. Inside the brackets, first things first, set content to something, even if it's an empty double quotes. This is so important, otherwise this ain't gonna work. Next, give them a position of absolute so that we can have the ability to move them around freely and size them relatively to the bar div. In this case, we want them to have 60% of the bar width, the same height and the same background color as the bar div, and also the same border radius of 2 pixels. Then we also want to make sure that they are centered by setting left to 50%. Great, so now let's select only the before element and move it by 4.5 pixels towards top. Then let's also do the same thing with the after bar, but for this one we want to push it towards bar. Now the only problem here is that both bars are not centered, instead they are 50% away from the left. So to fix that we're gonna use the transform property to translate them back by half of their width. Hit save and now they're perfectly centered. Now we're done from the nav bar, which means we can move on to the next step where we're going to add all those images to make the background image of this web page. For that, we need first to add a main tag underneath the header that's going to wrap all those layers of which the image is consists. Now if we give it some background color and remove the one we had on the web page, we can see nothing. That's because our main element does not have yet some height. So let's give it a height of 100VH which means it's gonna have 100% of whatever the window height is. Hit save and now you can see that the main element is right underneath the navbar and we also have a scroll bar because the navbar is already taking some space above the main element. So instead of that we want to have the navbar in front of the main element. This is actually very easy. Just go to the header element and give it a position of absolute. This will remove the header from the document flow. In other words, it's like we have removed the header from the HTML and now the main element is taking its place. Now, just to make sure that the navbar will be always in front of everything, we will give it a high Z index value. Now let's just add some padding in top and bottom and make sure that the navbar is always stick to the top of the web page. Great, so now that the main element is taking the full height, we can go ahead and start adding the layers inside the main element. Each image here should have a class of parallax, so that later on we can use this class to target all these images. Here as you can see I'm adding the layers in the same order they were in Photoshop. After this small and simple layer, we should have the text layer. So let's add here a div with class of text, give it also the parallax class. Then in here we're gonna have two headings, the first one is h2 and the second one is h1. Now let's keep adding the other layers and we're done. Notice here that both the sun rays and the black shadow layers does not have that parallax class because we want these two specific layers to stay static. We don't want to apply the parallax effect on them. Cool, so if we take a look here, we have our images arranged one below the other. Great, now in order to turn this mess into what we had in Photoshop, we need to mess around with the position and size of each layer here. To do that, let's first make sure that the main element cannot exceed the window width, and also let's set overflow to hidden so that anything that goes beyond the main element will be hidden. So now we can only see the sky because everything else that is beyond the main element has been clipped. 
and yeah let's also give it a position of relative to make sure that we size and place the layers relatively to this main element and yeah we're good now we can grab the background layer here first thing we want to do is set position to absolute in order to remove this layer from the document flow which means now we have the ability to move it around and size it however we want so for this one we first wanted to have a width of 2800 pixels Currently, we're only seeing the sky, so let's go ahead and center the image inside its parent. To do that, set top and left to 50%, then translate back the image by half of its width and height. Great, so that's what we currently have. Now if we take a look at the image we had in Photoshop, you see that we still have to move this image a little bit up so that we get the same result. To do that, I'm gonna wrap this inside the color function, then I'm just gonna do minus 390 pixels to move the image up. Let's also add 10 pixels to the left value and now it's good. Before we move on, just make sure that you don't modify or touch this translate value. Leave it always at minus 50%, minus 50% because we're gonna need that later when working with the parallax effect. Next we have the Fox 7 image, so here the same process again, we're just gonna mess around with the width and position and leave everything else as it is. So here's our fog, now to make sure that it will be always in front of the background layer, let's give this a z index of 2 and give the background a lower z index which is 1. Now we're just gonna keep doing this on all the remaining layers. Hold on one second here, at this point we've reached the text layer, things are a bit different here. So first of all, let's give this an absolute position and a z index of 9, since the last layer has a z index of 8 like so then let's push this to center very nice after that make sure that text online is set to center text transform to uppercase and color to white cool now let's grab the h2 hidden so in here we want it to be very thin that's why we have to set font weight 100 then we also want to raise font size to a very high value like 6.5 ram and great now for the other heading which is the h1 we want it to be extra bold so we're gonna increase font weight to 800 now let's also give it a font size of 8 ram and great right now our two headings are far apart from each other so let's decrease line height to something like 0.88 for both of them great now this layer must be moved here so let's again wrap this inside the calc function then let's do minus 130 pixels awesome now we can keep going Here we have the sun rays layer, as I've said before, we're not going to apply the parallax effect on these two layers. So for this one, we want it to be in the top right corner, and we want it to have a width of 595 pixels. Now let's move to the black shadow layer, so we want this to stick to the bottom, and we want it to have a width of 100%. Great, finally we have this fog one layer, unlike these two previous layers, this one will be included in the parallax effect. So let's come over here and change width to 1600 pixels, then let's give it instead a top of 100%. Now this will get the layer out of our window, so let's do here minus 355 pixels to move it back inside. Very cool, so now we have the whole background image merged again as it was in Photoshop. One more thing I would like to do before moving on is to add a vignette. So let's add here a div with class of vignette, then let's head over to the CSS file and grab that vignette class. In here we need to have a position of absolute, a z index of 100, the full width and the full height, and a top of left of 0. Hit save, and now the vignette div is covering the screen. Now in order to turn this into an actual vignette, we need to give it a radial gradient color. The shape of the gradient must be ellipse and must start from the center. Now in order to get a vignette, we need to start from a completely transparent black color, then move to a more opaque black color, something around 0.7. We added 65% here, so that the transition between the two colors will not start right from the center, instead it will start at 65% point. Perfect. Now let's target the parallax class to select our layers. Then in here we want to make sure that pointer events is set to none to prevent clicks and all the other cursor interactions on our layers. Now since every parallax layer has this line of code, let's put it instead inside the parallax class. This will make our code look clean. Now we still need to add pointer events none to the vignette div as well as the sun rays layer and the black shadow layer. Good. Now unfortunately we cannot select the text right here since we have set pointer events to none. So let's go ahead and enable that again by changing none to auto which is the default value. Awesome. Here I would love to change the selection color to some transparent green color and now it's better. Great, so with that being done we can start working on the parallax effect. So basically while we move the mouse we have to move those layers in different speeds in order to get the optical illusion of 3 dimensional depth. To do that we have to move to the javascript file. 
So after you link your GS file, come over here and first create a constant where you're going to put all those parallax layers. You have named that parallax underscore EL which stands for elements. Now the way that we're going to move our layers is by first creating two variables, one for the x axis and the other for the y axis. These variables will tell us how much pixels we're gonna move the layers from their initial position depending on the mouse coordinates inside the page. Currently let's set them to zero. Okay now apparently the layers will keep moving as long as we move the mouse, which means these two variables need to be updated every time you move the mouse. So let's go ahead and add an event listener of mouse move to the window. Now every time you move the mouse we need to get its new coordinates inside the window. We can get that from the event object. I've heard you asking what is this event object? Basically when an event listener like in our case the mouse move occurs it calls its associated function and it also passes a single argument to that function that is a reference to the event object. To get access to that event object, we need to give him here a name. This can be for example an E letter. So now every time we want to use that event object, we just have to call that E parameter. Awesome. Now this object contains information about the mouse move event that has just occurred. The mouse coordinates are some of these informations. We can get access to that using the client X and client Y properties of the event object. Console.log dash and as you can see as long as we're moving the mouse, the console keeps showing the current coordinates of the cursor inside the window. Currently these coordinates are relative to the top left corner. But we don't need that, instead we need them to be relative to the center of the window. In other words, what we really want to know is how far is the mouse from the center of the window. To get that, we just have to subtract half of the window width from the x coordinate and half of the window height from the y coordinate. Save that and now the mouse coordinates are relative to the center of the window. So as you can see if I put the mouse on the center, the console is showing us 0, 0. And if we move that towards top left corner, we're gonna have negative values. Great, so now that we know how far is the mouse from the center, both horizontally and vertically, we can go ahead and try moving the parallax layers by these values. So let's first call here all of our parallax layers. Now the query selector R method that we used here is going to grab all the parallax layers and put them into what's called a node list, which is just like an array. So, since we want to change the translate values of our layers, we have first to loop through that node list using the for each method and then do what we want to do. So, let's say for each layer element we got, we're gonna take that layer and access to its transform property. Now, if we take a look back here, you see that our layers already have this minus 50% minus 50% translate value. So, let's grab this and put it right here. Now, we can write this in one translate function like we have here, or we can split it into two translate functions, a translate x function and a translate y function. So it's the same thing as before but now it's much more clear and easier to read. Okay so now we don't want to remove this minus 50% because if we do so the whole background image will be missed. So what we're gonna do instead is use the call function to add this x value to dash minus 50%. Same thing here for the y axis. Now hit save. Alright, so currently the layers are still in their initial position because the mouse is at the center of the page, which means both x value and y value variables are currently equal to zero. But as soon as we start moving the mouse, all the layers will be moved by the same distance we have moved the mouse from the center of the page. Awesome. Now we can also add a minus to the x value variable. This way the layers will move in the opposite horizontal direction of the mouse. Great, currently all layers move at the same speed as the mouse. So what we're gonna do now is give each layer a specific speed in order to get a parallax movement like we have here. So going back here, we're gonna create a custom attribute that we're gonna name data speed x. In case you don't know that, you can actually create custom attributes on HTML elements to add your own information to those elements. Like in our case, we wanna add a speed value for each layer element here. So we created this data speed x attribute to add that information. Then later in JavaScript, we're gonna access to that value by calling that attribute. Awesome, now in this attribute, we're gonna add the horizontal speed of each layer. In a few moments, we're gonna create another attribute that we will use to add the vertical speed as well. Alright, so currently all the layers have 100% of the mouse horizontal speed. We can for example here decrease that speed to 30% for the background layer, which means now the background layer will have 30% of the mouse speed. Awesome, now let's add the speed attribute to the other layers. So for this fog layer, we want it to have a horizontal speed of 27%. Here as you can see, I'm using low values since the mouse movement is so fast. 
so we need to make sure that our layers will move slower than the mouse. Also notice that every time you move to the next layer, we decrease the speed because logically the layers at the front should move slower than the layers at the back. Great, so now that we gave each layer its appropriate horizontal speed, we can go ahead and use this speed in JavaScript. So in here we need first to create a variable where we're gonna put that speed value. Notice here that I created this inside the for each method because each layer element has its own speed value, which means each layer should have its own speed x variable where we're gonna add that speed. Awesome, now since our custom attribute name starts with data dash, there is an easier way to access to its value in JavaScript. So we just have to take our element, its dataset, dot, and then type whatever you have after the dash. Like in our case, we have speed x. Great, now that we have the speed x value of each layer, we can go ahead and multiply its horizontal movement by that speed value, which means now each layer will move at a different speed that is slower than the mouse speed. Beautiful, now this applies only on the horizontal movement, so let's go ahead and do the same thing to the vertical movement. So as I've told you before, we're gonna now create a second custom attribute called data speed y, which obviously will allow us to add this time the vertical movement speed. So yeah, mess around with the values and just make sure that the layers at the front will always move slower than the layers at the back, because that's how parallax works. Once you're done, go back here and this time create a variable named speed y where you're going to access to that speed y value of each layer. Then come over here and multiply the vertical movement of your layers by their speed y values. Let's check it now and boom, we now have an awesome parallax movement effect. Now there is a trick to make this movement smoother and that's by giving our layers a transition. So let's give our transition some duration like 0.45 seconds. Now if we save that, you can see that it's not working properly. So what we also need to do is change the transition easing. This means how the animation will proceed over time. Now CSS already has some predefined easings like ease the default value which starts slowly, accelerates in the middle and slows down at the end. There's also ease in, ease out and so on. In our case, we're not gonna use any of this. Instead, we're gonna create our custom transition easing using the cubic vizier function. So ours we wanted to start a bit fast and then slows down at the end. So here is how it behaves compared to the ease value that our layers currently have. So you see this one starts very fast and then slows down smoothly. To apply that on our layers, we just have to copy this cubic function, put it right beside the duration and there you go. Parallax movement now is so smooth and much better than what we had before. Hey wake up, we're not done yet here. So if we take another look at pre-made website, you see that the parallax movement here is more realistic and smoother simply because I've let the mountains here to rotate and I've let them also to move closer to us or further away from us. And that is exactly what we're going to do next. But hold on one second, if you have reached this point of the video, this means you're enjoying it. So make sure to smash that like button and remove the red color from the subscribe button. Great, so let's start off first by looking at how we can let the mountains move closer or further away from us while we're moving the mouse. So far our layers are moving along the x axis and the y axis. Now there's a third axis that we can move our layers along which is the z axis. So instead of moving our layers horizontally or vertically, we're gonna now move them closer to us or further away from us which is exactly what z axis means. Alright, so each layer element here is going to have this z value variable which will tell us how much pixels we're gonna move that layer along the z axis. For now, let's try moving them by 100 pixels. So, to move something along the z axis, we use the translate z function. So, let's set that to that z value variable. Now, this cell will not move the layers by 100 pixels towards us because in order for this to take effect, we also need to include the perspective function which simply will define how far the layers are from us. So for example, if I set here perspective to 2300 pixels, it will create a virtual space of 2300 pixels between us and the layers, and then it will move the layers by 100 pixels towards us. Save that. Actually, let's give this a bigger value like 1000. And now if we check it out, you see that the layers are now much more bigger because we've moved them very close to us. Okay, now you're probably asking, how are we going to calculate the z value for each layer? Alright, so let's say we have this mountain layer. If the mouse is moving towards right, the mountain should get closer and closer to us. Instead, if the mouse is moving towards left, the mountain then should keep getting further away from us. In other words, the amount of pixels by which we will move a layer along the z axis depends on the horizontal distance between the mouse and this layer. 
To calculate this distance, we need first to get the horizontal position of the mouse inside the page, then we need to subtract from that the distance between the layer and the left edge of the page. To get this last value, we just have to access our element signings using the get computed style method and then get from that the left property value. At this point, let's create here very quickly a variable containing the mountain tool layer and let's try using this computed side thing on it. As you can see, it's pinching the left value of that mountain layer. Now we need this value to be a number type. So back here, we're gonna use the parse float function on our value, which will return only the number from our value without that pixel at the end. Now let's try constantly.log this whole thing. So in short, all we did here is we got the horizontal position of the mouse inside the page. Then we subtracted the left value of the mountain from that by doing this we should get the horizontal distance between the mouse and the mountain like so. So at this point the constant is showing as zero since the mouse is actually on top of the mountain layer. Then the further away we get from the mountain the bigger the value gets. Here we have a negative values because the mouse is on the left of the mountain. Otherwise, if we are moving on the right of the mountain, we will then get positive values. Awesome. Now let's apply that on all the layers like so. Then let's go ahead and set translate Z to that Z value. Hit save and check this out. As long as we're moving the mouse towards left, the further the layers move away from us. On the other hand, if we're moving the mouse towards right, the layers then will get closer and closer to us. Now, logically, the mountains we have in the right side should have an opposite movement. This means if the left mountains are getting closer to us, the right mountains should move further away from us. In contrast, if the left mountains are this time moving further away from us, the right mountains then should get closer to us. To reverse the movement like I've just said, we just have to give this Z value a minus. But since we want to do this only for the mountains we have in the right part of the page, we need first to check for each layer if it is in the left side or in the right side of the page. So for that, we're going to create a variable named is in left. This variable should return either one if the layer is at the left part of the page or minus one if the layer is instead at the right part. So to achieve that, we're gonna use something called ternary operator. Basically, it's just a short syntax of the if else condition. So you first pass the condition you wanna be checking. In our case, we wanna check for each layer if it's in the left part or in the right part of the page. We can do that by simply checking if the left value of the layer is less than half of the page width. So if this condition is true, this means the layer is on the left part of the page. So we're gonna return here one. Else, if the condition is false, this means the layer is instead on the right side of the page, so we're gonna return here minus 1. Awesome, so now all you have to do is multiply the z value by this variable. So in case the layer is on the left side, this will be equal to 1, which means it's not gonna affect the movement. Else, if it's in the right part of the page, then this will return minus 1, which means it's gonna reverse the movement. Cool, so that's what we got. Back here, I'm gonna multiply this also by 0.1 just to slow down the movement a little bit. Great, now just like we've added speed to the X and Y movements, we're gonna now add it to the translate Z movement as well. So let's move to the HTML element and let's create a new attribute named data-speedz. Now we don't want the layers at the back to move along the Z axis at all, so we're gonna give them a speed of 0, like so. This mountain 9 will have a speed of 15%, mountain 6 will have a speed of 5%, mountain 5 will have a speed of 13%, like so. This one will have 32%, and finally the mountain 1 will have a speed of 53%. Let's go ahead now and get this speed z value from our layers, like so. Then let's multiply the movement by that speed. Save that now and look at that. The layers are smoothly moving closer to and further away from us. Now, to give this a more 3D feeling, let's go ahead and make the mountains rotate as well, just like I've did here. So you see the mountains at the front are rotating smoothly while we're moving the mouse. Let's see how we can do that. So back here, first thing we're gonna need to do is create a variable named rotate degree. This variable will tell us how much degrees we're gonna rotate the mountains by. For now, let's set that to zero. Now, this value needs to be updated while we're moving the mouse. So inside the mouse move event, we're gonna take our variable and update its value. The way we're gonna calculate this value is by checking the x value that tells us how far is the mouse from the center of the page. Then we're gonna divide that by half the width of the page. Currently, this will give us a value between minus one and one, depending on how far is the mouse from the center of the page. Now we're gonna multiply that by 20, which means now it's gonna give us a value between minus 20 degrees and 20 degrees. So if the mouse is at the center of the page, we're gonna get a value nearly zero. And if we're getting further from the center, that value will increase all the way to 20. 
very cool so now let's go ahead and set rotate y to that rotate degree value and of course do not forget to add the degree unit this rotate y function will rotate our layers around the vertical axis by that rotate degree value awesome now last thing we have to do is give each layer here a rotation speed just like we have did previously with the translation movements so again back to the html file we're gonna create again a new attribute this one will be called data dash rotation and let's set that to zero Again, the layers at the back are going to have a speed of zero. Then the closer we get from the layers at the front, that speed will increase like so. Finally, the mountain one will have a rotation speed of 20%. Now let's go ahead and get that rotation speed from each layer and let's multiply the rotation movement by that speed. Save that and check this out. The front mountains are now rotating smoothly, which makes the whole parallax movement even better and much more realistic. Now, if we reload the page and we don't move the mouse, you see the background image will be messed up until we move the mouse. This is happening because the layers at the moment of reloading the page does not have the transform property yet. They're gonna get that as soon as we move the mouse so to fix that we just have to give our layers that transform property at the moment of reloading the page to do that we can for example wrap this code that defines the transform property of our layers inside the function we're gonna name that function update uh, also make sure you first call that function here but hold on one second here if we check on the console you see that it shows as an error because that event object we use to calculate the mouse position cannot be used outside the event listener function one quick way to fix that is to pass that e.clientx value to the update function as an argument and then use the cursor position parameter to reference to that value inside the update function great so now all we have to do is go ahead and call that update function again this time outside the mouse move event which means it's gonna be executed at the moment of loading the page in this case we want that cursor position to be equal to zero save that now and yeah that problem is now fixed you know what i think it will be better if we give this a reveal animation as well the reveal animation we're going to create will look something like this to create this animation we're gonna use the gsap library so here we're gonna grab this library cdn then back inside the html file we're gonna add down here a new script tag to drop that cdn and with that being done we're able now to use that gsap library in our code now gsap has a really cool feature called timeline it's basically a container for animations and it allows us to chain together multiple animations now to create an animation and add it to our timeline we take our timeline and then we use one of the gsap animation methods in our case we're gonna use the from a method which will allow us to animate from a certain state there's also a to method which instead animates to a certain state but since right now all of our elements are already in their final to destination let's use an animation of from so using this method we're animating from whatever state we pass in here to our finished state we see here now if we check again the reveal animation we want to create you see that it consists from multiple animations so first we have the layers that are coming from the bottom then the navbar shows up while the main hidden is animating in let's see first how we can make the background image animates from the bottom to its current state so back here we just have to pass in a selector for our background layer then we can open parentheses and specify in here some properties for how we want the animation to occur so in here we can specify the states we want to animate our layer from let's say for example we want to animate from top equal to zero to whatever top value it has right now um we can also give it a duration of like 3.5 seconds and yeah that's basically how gsap animation works great so now in this case we want the background image to start from a certain position at the bottom and then scrolls up smoothly to its normal position so here inside the top property i'm gonna first add half of the background layer height to cancel the minus 50 percent translation that our layer was having then we can specify beside that how much you want to move the layer from the top edge so if i didn't specify here anything this means our background animation will start exactly at the same level as the top edge of the window and then scrolls up smoothly to its normal position we can do here minus 200 pixels and now the animation is starting from a closer position awesome now all the other parallax layers will have the same exact animation the same duration the same process we did here except for one thing that will differ from one layer to another which is this distance that defines from where the animation will start so in order to apply this same animation on all the parallax layers we're gonna first need to loop through each parallax layer we have and then apply this animation on each layer here we can simply say el and that will refer to the targeted parallax layer now for the starting position of each layer we're gonna define that inside a HTML attribute and then here we're gonna use that attribute to get the starting position of each layer so let's pretend we already have that and we have named it data dash distance now back here inside the HTML code we're gonna create that attribute 
like so. So for the background image, we have already decided that to be minus 200 pixels. The next layer is going to have a starting distance of 850 pixels and so on. Just make sure you increase the distance every time you move to the next layer. This way the front layers are the last ones to scroll up during the reveal animation. Save and look at that, we've got a nice parallax reveal animation. So you see the front layers comes in last, that's because we gave them a higher distance. Now the text layer is going to have its own reveal animation. So let's get rid of the distance attribute. Now before we go ahead and create the reveal animation of the text layer, we need first to make sure that this first animation will not be applied on the text layer. So currently this animation is applied on all the layers that got this parallax class including the text layer. So one quick way to exclude the text layer from this list is by using the filter function. Now unfortunately this function works only on arrays but here we have a node list. So let's turn this into an array using the array.from function. Now inside this filter method, we're gonna create a function that will be executed for each element in the array. In this function, we will check for each element if it has this text class or not. So if the current element doesn't have that text class, this whole expression will return true, which means the filter animation will keep that element in the resulting array. Otherwise, if that current element has that text class, it will not be added to that resulting array. By doing so, this filter method should return a new array containing all the parallax layers except the text layer, which also means the reveal animation will not be applied this time on the text layer. Great. I'm thinking about raising up the duration a bit and now the animation is a bit slower. Great. We can take this even a step further though and make it look a little bit cooler by using an easing function. And luckily for us, this GSAP library has a ton of easings already built in. The one we're gonna use is this power tree easing. So if we click on that, we can see how this power tree easing behaves. Now let's go ahead and set ease to power tree dot out and yeah, the animation looks much more smoother and cooler. With that being done, we can find Finally now go ahead and create the text animation. So down here we're gonna take again our timeline and add a new from animation to it. Um, let's take a look on the text animation we want to create. So you see this heading comes in from the bottom while this shine heading fades in and comes from the top. So basically we're gonna have two animations running simultaneously. So we have this Zeng GIG heading animates in at the same time while this China heading is also animating in. Let's first animate this Zeng GIG heading. So back here we're gonna target the H1 heading to select that Zeng GIG heading. And in this what I want to do is make it fly in from the bottom side of our screen. So I'm gonna add Y as a shortcut for the translate Y method. Then in here we need to push our heading by the distance that is between our heading and the bottom edge of the screen. To get this distance we're gonna take the window height and subtract from that the top position of our heading. We can get this top position by targeting again our heading like so. Then on that we can use a method called get bounding client ray. This method will return an object containing some properties or let's say informations about the position and size of our heading. Using the top property, we can get how far is the heading from the top side of the screen. Okay, so with that being done, we have now moved our heading right underneath the bottom side of the window. Okay, now I'm also gonna give this a duration of 2 seconds. Alright. Now using GSAP, we can easily specify when we want our animation to run. So for example, in the last animation, we have told the browser to wait one second and then run that animation. But the same way, we're gonna tell the browser this time to run this animation after 2.5 seconds from the loading of the page. So this means we're gonna have a delay of 1.5 seconds between the first animation and this second animation. Let's check this now and yeah, so you see the heading comes in smoothly from the bottom side of the page. Actually, we can move this even further from the bottom edge of the screen by adding here plus 200. Save that and now the heading comes in from 200 pixels underneath the bottom edge. Very cool. Now we can start working on the China heading animation. So you see here the China heading needs to fade in and come in from top. For that we're gonna add here a new from animation to our timeline. This time we wanna do it for the H2 which is the China heading. Then in here we're gonna move that heading by 150 pixels towards top to make sure we're coming from top. And we're also setting opacity to 0 so that the heading will be fading in. Let's give this a duration of 1.5 seconds. Now I want this animation to run after half a second from the start of the last animation. So for that I'm gonna define here 3 seconds. That's a delay of half a second between this animation and the last animation. Save that and yeah everything is just working perfectly. 
Now there is still one left animation that we need to work on. So if we look again here, you see that at a certain moment, all the other elements of the page will be fading in. To create this animation, we're gonna need first to give those elements that are gonna fade in a class of height. So we're gonna give that to the navbar, to the vignette, uh, and also to the sun rays and black shadow layers. After that, go back here and add a new from animation to our timeline. This time we're gonna target the height class, which means this animation will be applied on all those elements that we have given the height class to. In here, we're gonna set opacity to zero and let's define a duration of 1.5 seconds. Now we want this animation to start at the same time as the China hidden animation. So for that, I'm gonna specify here three seconds, just like I've did with the previous animation. Save that now and look at that. We have completed the reveal animation. Awesome. Now we can make the parallax layers move again because previously I've multiplied these by zero to disable the movement so that we can work comfortably on the reveal animation. Okay, so now the layers will move if I move the mouse. But here we should not be able to move the layers while the reveal animation is happening. So what we're gonna do back here is make sure we disable the movement while the reveal animation is running. So let's go inside this mouse move event and right here at the top of the moving function we're gonna need first to check if the reveal animation is running or not. For that, we're gonna say if, and for the condition, we're gonna use a GSAP method called is active. So let's target our timeline and let's do dodge is active. Now, this method will return true if the timeline is running and false if it's not. Now, if this returns true, this means the reveal animation is still running. For that, we're gonna say here return, which will end the function execution. So all this code below that will move the layers will not be executed anymore and so the layers will not move. Else, if the reveal animation has completed, the condition will be false and so the function will continue its execution normally. If we save that, you see that the parallax layers are no longer moving according to the mouse. That's because the isActive method is right now returning true. But as soon as the animation ends, we can move again the layers because that method is now returning false. And yeah, now we can move on to the next, actually the final step in this project and that is making this whole thing responsive because we currently have a real mess on small screens. It's gonna be very simple and quick. We're gonna start off with the 1100 pixel screens. So on these screens, I would like first to shrink the Zeng Jiaji heading a bit. Same thing for the China heading. So we want this one to have a font size of 4.57 RAM, like so. Next time we're gonna handle the 725 pixel screens. So on these screens, we're gonna shrink again our heading. So for the H1 heading, we want it this time to be five RAM. And we also want to decrease its line height. The H2 heading in the other hand will have a font size of 4.1 RAM and it's also gonna have a line height of 1.1. Awesome, here we also want to reduce the left and right patterns of the navbar and let's also make the logo smaller. Now let's target the navbar links. So in here we want to decrease the font size to 0.73 RAM. We want to decrease also the left and right patterns to 0.9 RAM. Now this will not be applied on this search link, so let's target it below that and let's reduce the font size for this one to 0.85 RAM and the left and right patterns to 1.8 RAM. Let's move now to the hamburger menu. So we first gonna decrease the left pattern, then we're gonna shrink the hamburger circle to 30 pixels in width and height. Check it now and you see that the whole nav bar gets smaller. Next time we're gonna work on screens that are smaller than 520 pixels. So in these screens, all we're gonna do is shrink again the two headings like so. Awesome. Now we don't want the size of these mountains and layers to be static. Instead, we want their size to be flexible. In other words, we want their size to automatically adjust as the screen size change. To do that, that we need to convert from pixel unit to percentage unit. Let's start off first with the background layer. So previously we gave it a width of 2800 pixels. If we divide that by 1440 which is my screen width, we're gonna get 1.9444 which means this 2800 pixels is equivalent to 194.44. Moving now to the top position, you see we have here 390 pixels. If we divide that by 810 pixels which is the window height, we're gonna get 0 0.4814 which means this 390 pixels is equivalent to 48.14%. Finally we will have 50% minus 48.14 which is equal to 1.86%. Now for the left position, we're gonna take the same pixels and divide it this time by my current window width which is 1440 pixels. We're gonna get 0 0.006 which means this same pixels is equivalent to 0.6%. If we subtract that from 50%, we're gonna have precisely 50.69%. And yeah, by following the same process, we're gonna convert the remaining pixel values to percentages. Great, so I've now converted all the pixel units used inside the layer's silence to percentages. 
If we check out now the website, you see that the layers are now adjusting their size and position to every screen. So you see if the screen is getting smaller or the layers will get smaller too. Now there is still one problem that we should fix to make this looks good and responsive and that is the height of the main element, which is the container of this whole thing. So currently it's always having 100% of the screen height. What I want to do here is make its height adjust automatically when the screen size change. To achieve that, we're gonna use JavaScript one last time. So back here, we're gonna calculate that main element height, but we're gonna do that in two different ways depending on the screen size. So if the screen or let's say the window width is greater than 725 pixels, we want the main element height, actually it's reference to that up here. So we're gonna say main equals document.query selector parentheses, and then in here, we're gonna target the main element. Okay, now back here, we want the main element dot style dot maximum height to be equal to whatever the window width is, times 0.6 which means if the screen width is bigger than 725 pixels the main element height will be equal to 60% of that screen width save that so you see right now the main element is taking the full height but when i'm gonna reload the page you see that it shrinks now to 60% of the screen width which will make the whole thing look more organized now for the screens that are less than 725 pixels, the main element will get too narrow. So we need to change the calculation of height for these screens. So instead of having here 0.6, we're going to multiply by 1.6 which will make the main element looks larger on these screens. Awesome. Okay, so now we're facing another problem. So you see if the screen gets very very small, the layers are also getting too small which is a thing that we should not have. Okay so that's happening because we're sizing the layers according to the main element width and not according to its height. So to fix that, we just have to size the layers according to the screen height instead in these small screens. So let's go to the screens that are smaller than 725 pixels and in here we're just gonna take each layer, delete its width value by setting that to initial and give it instead a height. To calculate this height, we're gonna take its previous width value value and multiply it by 1.6. Let's do the same thing to the other layers. And now if we save that, you see that the layers are now looking bigger in very small screens and everything now looks fine and nice on small screens. So yeah, that's it for today's project. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you do, make sure to click that like button. That small click from you helps so much. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next tutorial.